Famed World War II radio correspondent Edward R. Murrow turned television newsman dominated fledgling TV news and public affairs programs during the 1950s. Born Edgar Roscoe Murrow to a Quaker family in 1908, Murrow grew up in rural North Carolina, later moving to Washington State. He was very active socially and politically during his high school and college years. He changed his surname to Edward prior to graduating from Washington State University in 1930 with a bachelor's degree in speech. At a 1929 National Student Federation of America convention, Murrow gave a speech urging more student involvement in world affairs, eventually becoming the Federation's president. He established a student travel bureau and arranged international student debates. As one of many student activist organizations in the 1930s, the Federation cooperated with like-minded groups. Many were to some degree associated with or influenced by communist, socialist, or peace organizations. Communism and radical leftism were, in 1930s America, prominent and respected among intellectuals to an extent that now appears incomprehensible. Support for the American Communist Party declined when the party supported the Nazi-Soviet Pact in 1939. From 1932 to 1935, Murrow was assistant director of the Institute of International Education, established by Nobel Peace Prize winners who organized educational exchanges. Murrow found lectureships for European refugee scholars. In 1934, the organization sponsored a summer institute for American students at Moscow University. In 1936, during a communist uprising in China, an American-Chinese student exchange was established by the institute. Murrow joined the Columbia Broadcast System as director of talks in 1935, soliciting newsmakers for radio programs about various issues. Murrow was transferred to London to arrange cultural programs, later reporting war news where he earned fame for himself and CBS News. This is the CBS Television Network. Tonight, See It Now devotes its entire half hour to a report on Senator Joseph R. McCarthy. He has traveled far, interviewed many, terrorized some, accused civilian and military leaders of a great conspiracy to turn over the country to communism. The question is, did the Civil Liberties Union supply you with an attorney? They did supply an attorney. The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Uh, you know, the Civil Liberties Union has been listed as a front for and doing the work of the Communist Party. We must remember always that accusation is not proof and that conviction depends upon evidence and due process of law. This is no time for men who oppose Senator McCarthy's methods to keep silent or for those who approve. The actions of the junior senator from Wisconsin have caused alarm and dismay amongst our allies abroad and given considerable comfort to our enemies. And whose fault is that? Not really his. He didn't create this situation of fear. He merely exploited it, and rather successfully. Cassius was right. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. Gilbert V. Seldes was a widely respected American writer and cultural critic. He was one of the earliest and most influential writers on the popular arts in America. Throughout his life this Harvard-educated prolific writer was widely respected and deeply involved with all forms of popular and communications media as well as the arts. Edward Murrow and Seldes had a tense professional relationship. As a result of their disagreement over Murrow's portrayal of Senator Joseph McCarthy in Murrow's show, See it now. Seldes consistently advocated fair and responsible reporting, and criticized Murrow's intention to disprove McCarthy's credibility. Later in life Seldes was the founding dean of the Annenberg School of Communications at the University of Pennsylvania. You suggest that Ed, was not, uh, Ed Murrow was not totally unsympathetic to the criticism that Gilbert Seldes, who had been an old, old friend of his, offered for the McCarthy broadcast that this was a dangerous, potentially dangerous thing mm -hmm. to do for a broadcaster, mm -hmm. to use all that power he had against a political figure. Is there any indication that he thought later in his life that he had made a mistake there? He didn't regret it. He did, however, feel very uncomfortable about it. The minute you have 
somebody getting up to take on not an issue, but a person, that it was possible that you were setting a dangerous precedent. He obviously hoped never to have to do something like that again. Do you think that um, that kind of use of the medium is possible to repeat in our own times? Where I think his fears may have been quite legitimate were in a, a piece that he kind of roughed out about television in 1939, how to misrepresent through editing television, through camera work, through your choice of subjects. Do you think that was done in the McCarthy program? Uh, no, because they stood right up and said, this is our opinion, and this is the editorial, and if McCarthy feels that his words have been done violence to, we invite him back to give his side. What he was worried about was the appearance of objectivity when indeed there was none. Mr. Hanley, let me ask you this as you're leaving the news scene. What, what was the last time you um, let your opinion show uh, in a newscast? Most of the time, I think we, particularly in broadcast journalism, are professional enough that we don't let our private opinions run away with us and go unbridled, because our private opinions are really not that valid most of the time. The dearly beloved uh, and much missed Ed Murrow used to certainly project his own views of a, of a thing, though. Would you say that that was wrong from his point of view or not? Well, Ed, though, bless his heart, would usually say, this is my opinion about this. Yeah, yeah. And carefully label it. Yeah. And that's fine. That's mm -hmm. all right. Mm -hmm. Rose broadcast did much to end the anti-communist activities of Senator Joseph McCarthy. McCarthy's so-called witch hunt was over. Later, it would emerge that there were indeed many communist spies in the government and in the general population of the United States. Since the late 1920s, the Soviet Union, through its GRU, OGPU and NKVD intelligence services, used Russian and foreign-born nationals as well as American communists to perform espionage activities in the United States. One goal was the infiltration, placement and subversion of American political life at all levels of society. The Soviet Union benefited from its highly successful espionage efforts accelerating its atom bomb research. This was later confirmed by the U.S. counterintelligence program codenamed Venona. The Venona project provided insight into the alarming and hitherto unappreciated breadth and depth of Soviet espionage activities within the United States. Scanned images of the Venona documents as well as a history of the Venona program, titled The Venona Story, and other materials are available for download via the National Security Agency's website. Among those identified as Soviet assets were Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, Alger Hiss, Harry Dexter White, the second highest official in the Treasury Department, Lachlan Curry, a personal aide to Franklin Roosevelt, and Maurice Halperin, a section head in the Office of Strategic Services and many other Americans. Robert Morris for many years has been a key figure in the anti-subversion program of the federal government. He was chief counsel to the Senate Internal Security Subcommittee and during World War II was the officer in charge of the counterintelligence unit of the 3rd Naval District in Washington. After describing how President Roosevelt had ordered the Navy to allow Communist Party members to serve as radio operators with access to secret military communiques, Mr. Morris then turned to the subject of Soviet defector Viktor Kravchenko. So we had to meet him clandestinely and he was with the Soviet Purchasing Commission. And he had with him evidence, substantial evidence, that the Soviets were using the material, the naval material, that we were sending to them to fight the, for the Germans. They were not using it for that purpose, but instead they were building up, using it to build up a, a large navy in the post-war period to take on the British and the Americans. And I had to put extensive evidence of that. So I thought it was quite a coup. And two days later, I received orders to get out of the country with only two days' notice. Apparently, it came to the attention of the White House, and the White House didn't want anyone checking up on what the Russians were doing here. The Office of Strategic Services, known during the war as the OSS, was created to carry out clandestine operations against the Axis powers. It was headed by General William Donovan. It is now known that Donovan, instead of screening out members of the Communist Party, actually made contact with party functionary Eugene Dennis and recruited OSS personnel directly from Communist ranks. 
When the FBI provided General Donovan with evidence that some of his OSS personnel were members of the Communist Party, he replied, I know they're communists. That's why I hired them. The CIA and its predecessor, the OSS, came into the spotlight on numerous occasions. In 1952, the head of the CIA, General Walter Bedell Smith, stated publicly that he was sure there were communist agents working inside his organization. In 1967, Giorgio Rinaldi confessed that he had been part of a Soviet underground operation involving 300 officers in NATO, some of whom were American military officers. In 1954, Lieutenant Colonel Yuri Rasterov of the Soviet secret police sought political asylum in the West. He had been the director of Soviet espionage operations in Tokyo. After coming to the United States, he revealed that he personally had worked with several members of the American Military Intelligence Service. The best thing to ever happen to the communists was the Red Scare and Joseph McCarthy. He was a joke, right? The question is, was Joseph McCarthy right? I want to bring in M. Stanton Evans. He is the author of Blacklisted by History, the untold story of Senator Joe McCarthy. When you went to go look for the documents on Joseph McCarthy, what did you find or not find? Mostly what I found was uh, that uh, the FBI files, which backed up what McCarthy was saying, had been withheld for 50 years. And we now have them, or many of them, and they show essentially that he was right in general. There was a massive penetration of the government and that it was covered up and that he threatened that cover up. And that's why he was isolated, demonized, and destroyed. Right. Remember, World War II, the Soviet Union was our big ally. Right. They looked at the government back then and said, you know, the problem with this government, there are not enough communists in it. We need to go out and get more communists. So they had kind of like an affirmative action program for communists. And so they flooded into the government, particularly these temporary wartime agencies, the Office of Strategic Services, Office of War Information, and then all those guys at the end of the war were dumped into the State Department. And that's where all the McCarthy, most of the McCarthy cases came from. They came from those agencies. Anti-communist leaders like Mihailovic in Yugoslavia, Chiang Kai-shek in China, and others were delegitimized by this very same technique. Soviet agent named Solomon Adler, sitting in Chongqing, China, 1944, sending back similar reports about Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek is not fighting the Japanese. He's a collaborator. Only the communists are fighting the Japanese. Well, then cut off Chiang Kai-shek, give the aid to, to, to the communists. China falls to the communists. It's a pattern. If you needed one more reason to despise the ignorant and angry lynch mob of losers who burned Ferguson to the ground and inspired Occupy cells across the country to attempt to resurge, all under the lie that six foot four, 300 pound thug Michael Brown was, quote, viciously murdered with his hands up while he was running away from a police officer. All, of course, uh, proven to be false. I was just watching CNN and took this picture of a story that they were airing about the Ferguson police officer, Darren Wilson, now having resigned. When I happened to notice this banner being held by the Ferguson protesters. And this certainly was not an isolated incident. Here's just one of many communist banners. Uh, being held at Ferguson events. Even the pastors have joined the uh, communist, showing how far America has degenerated when uh, people have openly embraced communism. Do not be quick to dismiss comments that might be considered heretical. There may be more than a kernel of truth to those who are neatly labeled by mainstream commentators. Those commentators can and do provide their opinions, increasingly motivated to boost advertising ratings rather than maintain high standards of journalistic ethics. Truth tellers today often suffer ridicule, degradation, or worse. Perhaps our United States of America would be a much different place if Joseph McCarthy's accusations were accorded the credibility that has emerged over time. Edward R. Murrow was an excellent journalist worthy of respect. However, just like McCarthy, Murrow's power and influence colored his judgment. Murrow's opinions, shaped by his Quaker upbringing, student organizing experience and personal political beliefs led him to speak as if his opinion was fact. Unfortunately for the United States of America, his viewers, and ultimately millions of people believed him too, even in the face of contradictory evidence. Thank you.